I just like to encourage you. I don't know if you live in a hot climate or a cold climate or you're surrounded by a concrete jungle, but any opportunity you can get, please spend some time in nature. You look all around me, sometimes it's just good to get outside of the mainstream city. You see the city down below. And sometimes it's good to escape to get out of the city and to spend some time in the greenery. When you're around nature, you're away from the loud music, you're away from the car horns and you can just hear the crickets chirping, you can hear the birds tweeting and you're just around natural environments which just makes your mind tranquil. You know one thing I find very interesting is when many creationists try to defend creation using intellect. Now when you read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, the Bible says through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, this is a supernatural act. You cannot explain that intellectually. So we have to accept it by faith. But that doesn't mean that we cannot challenge modern Darwinian evolutionary science. So in this study, I'm going to show you how important it is to study nature. In post-Reformation Europe, especially in Britain, then trickling into the United States, Deep thinking men knew that the best way to understand the world and the mechanism of life is by studying nature. And this is a divine principle instructed by God himself. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Continuing this school of thought, Richard Baxter, a 17th century English Puritan, theologian, poet, hymn writer, who has been called the chief of Protestant schoolmen, wrote a book titled The Reformed Pastor, which if all pastors read this, it would transform their own lives and the lives of their congregations. He instructs us to study nature when he said that when man was made perfect and placed in a perfect world where all things were in perfect order, the whole creation was then man's book in which he was to read the nature and will of his great creator. Every creature had the name of God so legibly engraven on it that man might run and read it. It was therefore his work to study the whole volume of nature. This book, The Christian Philosopher, is the foundation and main inspiration for the Origin of Species series. It was written by a Scottish theologian and scientist, Thomas Dick, who had a brilliant mind and an in-depth knowledge of science. He said that the wisdom of God is doubtless displayed in every arrangement he has made throughout all the provinces of his immense and eternal kingdom, however far they may be removed from the sphere of human observation. But it is only in those parts of the system of nature which lie open to our particular investigation that the traces of this perfection can be distinctly perceived. Another Scotsman by the name of James Aiken Wiley verified this also when he said that if you could have a really true and useful science, you must go to nature. You must study her laws. You must observe her workings. You must put her to the question. You must sit down at her feet and become her disciple and listen reverentially to her voice. In the United States, Edward Alexander Sutherland, a brilliant educator, continuing that same school of thought, also said that the true way to study the sciences is to come in touch with nature. Cotton was a plant that was grown in the south in North America, but it depleted most of the nutrients in the soil. So the father of Kemergy, who laid the groundwork for organic farming, encouraged planters or farmers to plant peanuts, which he later became famous for, 
where he made over 300 products from this lagoon. It was a famous chemist and botanist, George Washington Carver, who continued the same school of thought when he said, more and more as we come closer and close in touch with nature and its teachings are we able to see the divine and are therefore fitted to interpret correctly the various languages spoken by all forms of nature. This eight column portico modeled after the Pantheon in Rome is the Royal Exchange in London. At the top among the many pagan deities it is clear when it says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, quoting from Psalms chapter 24 and verse 1. But there is an intense struggle to remove God as creator out of the minds of the masses. And modern secular science, which is founded and still guided by a hypothesis, are now saying, well, what if man and dinosaur walked contemporaneously? What would of the earth be like? Whatever scientific speculations both naturalists and cosmologists present to the public, cleverly packaged into digital format, though even at the doors is guided by the science of faith. For clarification for the origin of species, we must number one, look to the fossil records and number two, study nature itself to see if creatures were either evolved or created. Here are the eggs of dinosaurs and it sure has not evolved into anything else. They're still dinosaurs. I purchased this fossil of a reptile found in a pebble from Madagascar called Neoliapsida and dated according to the secular timescale of 260 million years old, but it is still a reptile. This fossil is an extinct genus of ray finned fish, Paleoniscum, also dated to the same Permian time period as the reptile Neodipsida. But when looking at modern fish, they are still fish and there is no evolving taking place. Many will argue that there are fish that can live outside of water, which is true, they can, but they are still fish. Neil Shubin is an American evolutionary paleontologist who claimed that he found the missing link with the discovery of a fish called Tiktaalik a Canadian Inuit word that means freshwater fish, which he claims is the evolutionary transition from fish to amphibians. But it's a fish. And no matter how hard the scientific community try, with diagrams, journals and documentaries, there is no missing link. Let us now study one of the most amazing creatures on this earth, the ant. There are 22,000 species of ant. And those scientists make regular breakthroughs in understanding the different roles of many different creatures throughout the animal kingdom. The creature that intrigues science the most is the ant for their organizational skills as soldiers, workers, architects, constructionists, agriculturalists, environmentalists, and their well-organized colonies and networks. I filmed these ants in my back garden to get a glimpse of how they work. My mother told me that when growing up in Barbados, whenever you saw ants running frantically around their hole, then you know it was going to rain. How does modern secular science describe the ant? It reads, the ants are one of several groups of social insects that belong to the order Hymeneptera. The ancestors of the ants are believed to have been solitary fossil wasps. Interesting. Now how do they prove this? It says little is known about the initial evolution of ants. That's because they didn't evolve. For few fossils antedating the early tertiary period about 70 million years ago have been found. This is a flying ant I filmed in my back garden. And why only a few 
grow wings, and most of the rest of the other ants do not is even a mystery to science. Here are two modern ants encased in a glass. They have the head, thorax, the abdomen, and six legs, one of the main descriptions of an insect. And here is another ant encased in Baltic amber. And if you look very, very closely, after all these years, they claim millions, it's um, still an ant, no evolving. Our modern world and all its technical intricacies, unbeknownst to most people, operates or is modelled after the colony of the ants. I have been carefully studying journal after journal, observing the study of ants, and I stumble across Marco de Rigo, who is a research director for the Belgium Fund for Scientific Research. And he co-wrote a book, Ant Colony Optimization, where he showed that the study of ants helps in many breakthroughs in the modern world. Ants exhibit complex social behavior that have long since attracted the attention of human beings. There are a considerable number of researchers, mainly biologists, who study the behavior of ants in detail. One of the most surprising behavioral patterns exhibited by ants is the ability of certain ant species to find what computer scientists call shortest paths. Biologists have shown experimentally that this is possible by exploiting communication based only on pheromones, an odorous chemical substance that ants may deposit and smell. It is this behavioral pattern that inspired computer scientists to develop algorithms for the solution of optimization problems. Several different aspects of the behavior of ant colonies have inspired different kinds of ant algorithms. Examples are foraging, divisions of labor, brood sorting, and cooperative transport. In all these examples, ants coordinate their activities via stigmagy a form of indirect communication mediated by modifications of the environment. A very similar study has been conducted by modern science that includes space technology and some of the academic institutions in North America. They sent a rocket into space to attach it to the International Space Station in late 2014 to do an experiment on how ants behave in microgravity. This is known as collective behavior and comparing on how ants act on earth, where they've also set up a curriculum for children to teach them how ants operate and behave in their own habitat. And the study was also to help scientists operate safely while in space. As I read through countless journals, it is amazing how much the modern world has depended upon the ants the Journal of Experimental Biology in 2010 says that routing telephone calls through busy networks while minimizing connection time, constructing complex machinery while keeping costs and build time low, and finding the most efficient set down and pick up routes for delivery vehicles are all examples of combinatorial optimization problems. Probably the best known nature inspired algorithm used for NP hard problems is ant colony optimization, ACO. ACO was inspired by the foraging behavior of trail laying ants. Many ant species construct foraging networks by laying furonym trails towards food sources. Fire ants are able to form a living raft with their bodies when floods come when they carry their whole colony, including the eggs. It baffled the scientists how they were able to do this, even without their bodies becoming waterlogged. That was a mystery. But on further investigation, they found that the ants interlocked their legs and mandibles together to connect the colony as a whole. The cooperative behavior of flocks, schools, and swarms has received much attention by biologists, mathematicians, and roboticists. With all this in-depth study on these amazing creatures, the secular academic world are unconsciously following a divine method. Out of all the creatures 
on God's earth. Which one did God instruct us to study and to learn from? Go to which creature? The ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways, because the females are the workers, and be wise. Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Hmm. I thought the Bible was a book of outdated fairy tales. Interesting. I decided to film a number of different species to observe how they operate in their own environments. This amphibian is well camouflaged in its surroundings. But the question I would ask, when did this adaptation, not into another creature, but to its environment take place? For other colour frogs clearly stand out. This is a leaf insect I have encased in a glass. It looks amazing. I filmed a leaf insect and a stick insect, and they both have bodies that resemble either a leaf or a tree branch. Modern science would have us believe that their appearance is one whole camouflage. But if we believe that God created them in a perfect world, then what is the need of camouflage? That's something to think about. This photo on the left, with a diagram on the right, is of the oldest fossil of a leaf insect and it was found and its usual lengthy timescale of, they say, billions of years, says, fossils of phasmid insects are extremely rare worldwide. Here we report the first fossil leaf insect, Eophilium messelnensis, from 47 million year old deposit at Messel in Germany. The new specimen, a male, is exquisitely preserved and displays the same foliaceous appearance as extant male leaf insects. This fossil leaf insect bears considerable resemblance to extant individuals in size and cryptic morphology, indicating minimal change in 47 million years. This absence of evolutionary change is an outstanding example of morphological and probably behavioral status. Well, it actually proves that the fossil record does not in any way, shape or form support transitional change from one species into another. That's what the journal should have rightly said. I would like to observe different types of skin in animals. Let us look at birds and their vast array of colours, shapes and sizes. The Bible is very clear that these animals were created on the fifth day of creation. Carefully looking at how beautiful these creatures are, distinct for their beak, feathers and laying of hard-shelled eggs. Modern science say they evolved from reptiles and as usual their evidence is scant. Reptiles like this giant tortoise does lay eggs like the birds but it's a reptile with its tough skin. These lizards have similar or the same skin like tortoises. When I carefully observe these creatures I am just in awe and the scientific data that has been and is still being collated only strengthens and does not weaken my faith, especially when the actual evidence contradicts people's preconceived ideas. This caiman lizard was not too impressed with me filming it up close, but observing its scaly skin and how the different colours meld into each other, to me it's amazing. The snake is probably the most feared creature on this earth. Except from eagles and mongooses, every species runs a mile, but they are, when there is glass between you and them, beautiful to look at. This is a king cobra. You do not want to have it out with one of these. As it yawns, I am not sure if that it is a sign of tiredness or if it is just hungry for a meal. But as it looks at me, probably not impressed like the caiman lizard to be filmed, this reptile's slithering movements is how it moves, and it has the same skin as other reptiles. But was this how the snake originally looked? Modern science and Christians are both guided by faith. Darwinian evolution says that the snake lost its arms and limbs during transitional change. 
The Bible in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14 said that it was cursed, and upon thy belly thou shalt go. On every continent in the world, the serpent was depicted with wings. From Babylon in the east in Asia, they had a winged serpent. The ancient Egyptians in Africa had winged serpents in their religious art. In ancient Greece in Europe, the winged serpent is on a jar. And in Mexico in Central America, they worship the feathered winged serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. It almost seems like the ancients preserved or had a knowledge of pre-fall Eden. Our last set of animals we will look at are mammals. These warm-blooded creatures, like the serpent, according to Genesis, was created on the sixth day of creation alongside mankind. I still plan to explore and study these creatures a lot more deeply, but there is one I need to study quite quickly, and there is a reason why. The lemur is a creature that looks like it is on its way to extinction, and it is because of the greed of man and his expanding corporate interests. A stinging report, Madagascar, the new El Dorado for mining and oil companies, written by IRESA and published by Friends of the Earth, says in part, the people of Madagascar are the first victims of the approach of the international corporations that are trying to take the utmost advantage of the island's mineral potential. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are very much responsible for this situation as they have encouraged the Malagasy leaders to liberalize the economy in order to make it more attractive to foreign firms has been granted tax breaks while tax-free zones have sprung up all over the country. Oil, ilmenite, bauxite, nickel, cobalt, corundum, zircon, coal, garnet and graphite among other minerals as well as timber have seen major mining conglomerates increasingly entering the country. And the more timber you cull, the less habitat lemurs have to live on. So I decided to film these lemurs at a zoo for myself as they are a species on the verge of extinction. This is the black and white ruffed lemur. And as I observe it, the Madagascar people who are known as deeply superstitious call them ghosts or spirits for their wide, bright, piercing eyes. Despite this piercing look, this male remained quite chilled. And this is the most endangered of all lemurs. The ring-tailed lemurs are more vast in number, but they are also on the verge of extinction due to corporate interests. And why many conservationists are overly concerned is that this animal is only found in Madagascar and nowhere else. And as poverty is dramatically increasing in that country, hard times is forcing the indigenous population to hunt lemurs and make them into the evening dish. So I decided to analyze and study these creatures before it's too late. And in this up and coming DVD, part one will be going through the days of creation and I will follow the biblical principle of how to study nature. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knoweth not that in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this. Before I sign off, I just wanted to say uh, I'm very grateful for all the people who've donated to Even at Doors. I'm very grateful it has helped to keep the ministry afloat. And for all those who have been buying the DVDs recently, it is helping to finance the ministry. And for those who have phoned and who've given words of encouragement, I just want to give this opportunity. If I haven't emailed or um, responded by Facebook or text, I just wanted to say I'm very grateful for the support which you've um, given Even at the Doors. So I'm very grateful. and. 
just please help to contribute towards this ministry and I will continue to do more studies as long as there is breath in my nostrils.